Um, but welcome everybody to our second SSI Fellows community call. You're all very welcome. It's great to see you again this month. I'm just going to go through um, some general guidance for the call as usual. So welcome. Um, you should recognize this by now, unless this is your first time with us, but uh, in general, do be kind uh, to yourself and to others. Um, be understanding and flexible. Uh, we all are in a lot of calls these days, so it can get very tiring and we don't want to burden you with an extra call, but we do want to provide a space where you can meet and network with each other and um, share what you're working on. Uh, we do have a code of conduct. It is linked in the notes um, along with the reporting policy. So uh, if you need to report any misconduct, please do so either to myself or Schwab. This call is being recorded and the videos will be made available on the SSI YouTube channel after the call. Um, but just to note that things that happen within breakout rooms will not be recorded. Um, so in that case, uh, do turn on your video if you don't mind sharing your face or turn it off if you do. And keep yourself muted when not speaking in order to minimize background noise. Um, so the notes document, which I've uh, sent in the chat and I can send again in a minute, um, we're, we really uh, enjoyed how everybody engaged with it last time and we noticed that people shared some really interesting but also some some personal things. So we do want to just note that the, the notes documents will be for SSI fellows only. So please don't share those links publicly. Um, but do use them to take notes, ask any questions, add friendly comments, plus one, etc. Um, but in general, if uh, you or if SSI wants to uh, maybe publish any blog posts or guides um, based on the results of the discussion, so more, more general topics of discussion and shared insights, then that is very welcome. Um, we won't share any personal information, but if you would like to be contacted and included on anything as a contributing author, um, such as any resulting blog posts or guides, um, do please include your name um, as part of anything that you share within the documents and we'll follow up with you. Um, I don't know if that'll happen um, based on today's call, but that's just sort of a general statement um, about how to get involved with anything that can come afterwards. Um, as this is the beginning of the SSI Fellows community calls, we will be experimenting over the coming months until we find a call format that suits you best. So the goal of these community calls is to facilitate community building and encourage collaboration within the SSI Fellows community. We want to check in with the fellows and offer community care. We want to hear what you're up to and how we can support you. And we want to provide a welcoming and inclusive space for fellows to share and explore topics of interest and network with others. Um, and I guess just quickly before I go on, did anybody want to shout out anything that they shared in their check-in? People seem to be doing well, maybe some burnout. I do hope everybody is taking some time this summer to hopefully relax a little bit. I feel like it's going by in a blink. Um, but if not, I'll carry on. So today we have fellows updates from uh, Derek, Stewart, and Ben. So we'll hear from them in a minute. And then the second half of our community call, we'll hear a presentation from the SSI communications team. Um, just how they're just going to introduce themselves and share how they can support you in your activities. And they're also looking for some feedback on some on some topics. Uh, so that will be the focus of some of the breakout rooms and, uh, and then we'll wrap up before the, before the hour. So I just wanna quickly talk about the breakout rooms this afternoon. So well, some of the feedback that we got last time was that some fellows wanted to propose their own topics for discussion within the breakout rooms. So there is space um, under the welcome section in the notes if you want to add your own breakout room topic, um, so something that you can discuss in a group for 15 minutes, feel free to add that and your name. Um, but otherwise, Selena would really like to chat to some folks about a newsletter, um, a monthly fellows newsletter. And Jacqueline would like to talk to uh, some folks about blog content. So get your feedback on what kind of content you want, what kind of content you want to read about and write about, and how we can support you writing blogs as part of your fellowship. Um, the way that we'll push you into breakout rooms is that we'll just need you to write the number associated with that breakout room topic next to your Zoom name. So as the call goes on, um, if you want to decide which, which topic you want to discuss in a breakout room, you just add that number to your Zoom display name. And uh, Selena and Jack will talk a bit more about those discussion topics during their presentation, so, you, so you'll have some time to hear a bit more about it. 
But with that, we'll move on to our fellows updates. So this is an opportunity for fellows to share, show and tell during our community calls. So we'll have five minutes talk from each one plus two minutes Q&A. And if you want to share something in the future, we'd love to hear about your fellowship plans, demos of projects, upcoming events or other activities, projects for which you're seeking support or collaboration, life after the fellowship and how the fellowship impacted your career or anything else you want to share with the network. So first up, we have Derek. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Should I try to share my screen? Yes. Okay. Let's give it a shot. Um, all right. Let's see. Okay. Does this work? It does. Okay. Very good. Um, so <laughs> good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I see a few uh, familiar names. I saw Sarah in the call. I saw Schweb in the call. So nice to see you again. Um, I've, yeah, I've been out of the loop for quite a while. Um, there are many reasons for that. Um, one involves having two young kids um, and other ones I'll, I'll touch upon in these slides. Um, I'll, I'll stick to the five minutes, of course, uh, but I thought, well, the first meeting I couldn't join, it clashed with my agenda, but then I looked at the minutes and there were all sorts of nice little nuggets that I found there. There's some really nice comments here and then uh, a referral to gather.town, which I'd never heard of, but which looked tremendously interesting. And I thought, well, you know what, I'll join for the call and just give a bit of an update because uh, actually it's been a while since I've been in touch with the SSI. So I prepared a few slides, um, but because not everybody knows me, especially not after so many years, um, I thought I'd first talk about my year at the SSI. So back in, back in 2014, I was a postdoctoral researcher in the chemistry department at uh, UCL. And basically I was trying to become scientifically independent. I wanted to write uh, papers and sort of, yeah, figure out, okay, can I actually stay in academia or will I just fall below the bar, bump my head and end up at some company. And I really wanted to try and stay in academia because I really liked the creative aspect of it all. Um, and yeah, if, if I can't put creative elements in my work, I get very bored. So I was trying really hard, um, applied for the SSI, got a fellowship. And then during that year, um, basically, I, I did a range of things with the fellowship. I attended a conference, for instance, but um, the main thing I did was organize a, a paper hackathon, uh, which you can see in the bottom left at a, a Zen Buddhistic retreat near Northampton. Um, it, it was never used for any event after that. Uh, <laughs> But it, the hackathon was a pretty good success. Um, there, there were yeah about 20 participants. Uh, we wrote all, all sorts of papers. Some got published, some got stuck in the review uh, stage. Uh, some were stuck in the preprint stage, but uh, everyone had a good time and it was a thing worth repeating. Um, on the bottom right, you can see more or less what it entails to organize a paper or science hackathon. And on the top right, you can just see what I was working on at the time. It was brain blood flow modeling and uh, materials modeling. And it turned out to be quite a turbulent year because um, in that year, I was heavily applying for faculty jobs. Hence the, the, the campy comic, I guess, or the, the cliche comic. Um, but <coughs> after 2014, everything changed because basically I got a lectureship at Brunel. My first daughter was born. Um, and we also started moving house. So uh, yeah, a, a huge number of things uh, changed after that, basically. Um, interestingly enough, I was working on a project called 2020 Science back in 2014. So uh, it's quite fitting now. Um, so that's more or less what I did during my, um, yeah, during my fellowship. And I was very much focused on trying to get the mentality around large software projects better because I was involved in a lot of EU projects. And I just saw people developing a lot of software and it all falling apart after the projects had concluded. The year after, I started uh, apparently two lectureships, one at Brunel and Greenwich at the same time, but the one in Greenwich was in error. So I started at Brunel and uh, told Greenwich that uh, I shouldn't have been appointed because I declined the job. Um, and the first two years were quite tough. Um, and my personal life was difficult, but also professionally, I applied for proposals, but the first proposal got rejected uh, quite badly and I spent a lot of time on it. And then the second one was accepted, but it didn't count towards my uh, probation requirements, which were quite strict. Um, so yeah, then, and, and that project actually was quite difficult. It was about parallelizing blood flow simulations in time. Uh, but yeah, that was a total struggle. And then in 2016, I had an argument with my head of department who kept encouraging me to apply for small grants that I didn't see such 
good chance of success. And I basically decided to take my own approach and, and stay in the arena that I had more experience, which was uh, applying and participating in EU grants. Um, and then uh, around that year, things started to become a lot better. And uh, I actually got a lot of EU projects accepted. So at the moment, I'm in two EU projects as a partner, uh, as a PI for Brunel, uh, VECMA, which is about uh, uncertainty quantification, verification and validation, and Hidalgo, where they model uh, global challenges. And I think one, one nice thing that happened after the fellowship was that I felt much more confident to just undertake independent developments and, and go into different directions. So one direction I took was that I went from blood flow uh, to migration modeling, uh, which yeah I do a lot uh, in the Hidalgo project. And then um, basically after that, once those projects started, uh, I found myself working alone on two large projects. So I, I hired four research fellows. You can see them in the bottom, uh, bottom left. Um, and now, yeah, these days we're actually working on three different codes. So we have a modeling code for migration, one for COVID-19 spread in local boroughs, which we only started on in March, and an automation toolkit that I already worked on for, I think, eight years or something. Um, and all four of them work quite heavily on that. So we do quite a lot of, of software development software engineering and we also do with other developers in other countries so actually a lot of the little lessons that i learned in the collaborations workshops and in other places were really useful in me to try and figure out how to approach these kind of projects and particularly in in vecma uh, i i basically am the technical manager so there are about 15 to 20 developers across different countries and i'm trying to figure out okay how can we develop a toolkit that is actually easy to sustain and that people actually want to use. Um, so those were things that I was very much focused on uh, after my fellowship. But I've, yeah, the SSI year sort of really prepared the ground for that because I felt much more confidence to be independent, but also had a much better grasp about, okay, what kind of dynamics work, work better and what ones, uh, which ones work worse. And that, that was both from interacting with the other fellows, but also from the various paper and science hackathons um, that I organized and, and participated in. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I think the five minutes is up. Do you want to? The five uh, minutes just is up. up. Okay. Really quick. Sorry. Yes. Um, I'll keep it very short. Sorry. I, I didn't have a timer here. Um, I think I leave this one as the last one just for people. I just wanted to say what happened with the paper hackathon was that there were quite a few more editions. So the year later, we did one in Cambridge, then one in Lausanne, Switzerland. Then we did one at CERN in 2018. And then last year, we did a, a small hackathon in, uh, in Ethiopia. And what I'll do is I'll leave you with this last slide. How about that? Awesome. Thank you so much. And feel free to add it. I think you added the slides to the notes as well. But does anybody have one quick question for Derek? Well, it sounds like you've accomplished a lot since your fellowship. And um, I'd be interested to hear more about the COVID-19 work that you're doing with. I think we want to try and highlight fellows who are working in that area. So um, if it's all right, I'll follow up with you um, by email, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. No problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. If anybody has any questions for Derek, um, do please feel free to add them to the notes and um, he can answer them there. But okay. Next, we have uh, Stuart. And I do have a, a timer linked in the notes. Sorry, I should have I should have said that to start with. So I'll just be clicking that if, if that helps you keep track of time. Uh, Stuart. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, because this thing takes up my whole screen. So uh, <laughs> fair enough. Am I good to share my screen? Yes. Cool. Okay, can people see that okay? Yep. Yeah, magic. Sorry, I've got too many screens and, and things going on. Okay, um, so I'm Stuart Grieve. Um, I want to talk about our project that myself and Van Hobley are starting um, in the, the coming months whenever we have, have time for it. So firstly, for people that don't, don't know me, um, I'm a computational geomorphologist by, by training. Uh, so that means I study the processes that happen on the Earth's surface. Um, I'm a lecturer in physical geography at QMUL, a position that I was able partly to get thanks to my SSI fellowship. I was in the 2018 cohort. Um, and something that I've been coming up against in the last few years now that I'm kind of applying for my own grants and doing independent research is that NERC is massively lagging behind other funders in actually funding software research. So funding the development and maintenance of software um, as opposed to uh, just funding traditional discovery science that has a software component. 
And looking at the recent um, EPSRC RC call highlights one of the ways that things could be done a lot better in our discipline. And as a result, there's a number of us that are working in various different ways to lobby NERC to kind of look at what EPSRC are doing and to, to start funding software more sustainably. Um, but one of the things that we run up against is that we don't really have a good evidence base. So we have all the, the generic surveys that have been done talking about how important software is for science, but we don't have anything kind of specifically around our communities. So the idea came about um, with myself and, and Dan Hobley, a 2019 fellow, um, to put something together that I'm kind of, for the moment, calling the Surface Science Software Survey, but there's probably too many essays in that. Um, and the idea is that we just want to understand who's using software in their research within the surface science community and how they're using it. So doing things like gathering data on are people using open or closed source tools? How do people cite software? What are their language preferences? What demographics of people are using different software tools in their research? Um, part of this has been inspired by um, a paper that um, David uh, Perez Suarez was involved in, another SSI fellow. Um, which did a survey of computational tools in solar physics. And I've got the link there and I've put it in the notes. Um, so it's not a completely new idea, but it seems like something that we can adapt. Um, so the reason I wanted to, to come on this call was just to kind of ask for advice. Um, so the first thing is, um, do we have any social science fellows who would be interested in being involved? Um, so as physical scientists, we don't really know much about working with actual humans. So if there's people with expertise or could introduce us to someone that could be really useful for us to make sure that we don't do something fundamentally flawed in our um, the design of our survey and our methodology. I'm also wondering if people have recommendations on different survey platforms. My instinct is to use, um, is to use Google Forms and Google Sheets, but I don't know if there are uh, better options out there. And if any of those are commercial, does the SSI have subscriptions to things or are they able to contribute costs? It's something I just have no idea about. Um, similarly, if people know about um, similar projects in other communities like the solar physics survey work that's been done, I'd really love to see that and be pointed towards that. Um, and if anyone's done things like this before, if they have any advice or warnings about ethics or about the methods being applied, um, again, that would be really useful. And finally, thinking about your own software communities and your own research communities, if you could ask a question to people, what would that question be around their software usage? So I'll, I've put all those questions in the, the Google Doc as well as a link to these slides, um, but I'm happy to spend the last few minutes uh, talking about this if people have questions or advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, does anybody want to chime in and answer any of these questions before we open it up to questions for Stuart? Any social scientists? Um, to answer your question based on if commercial can SSI contribute to costs, um, in general, we are happy to support things. Um, just submit a funding request via LOFAT and we can start the conversation around how um, we can support that. Um, as well as platform recommendations. I think we tend to use Google Forms a lot because we tend to use things as affiliated with Google Drive. Um, I believe people are filling out um, answers to your questions in the notes as well. Does anybody want to unmute and voice anything? Um, I'm just going to put in something about ethics, but if you want it to be just information, then you don't really have to go down the ethics route. But if you want it to be proper research piece, then you need to think about the ethics up front. Really, you don't necessarily need to have a research piece for it to influence people, but if you want it to have that standing, then ethics is your first pop of call. Okay, thank you. Um, and it looks like Rico would be happy to get involved as well. Uh, Leo, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering um, if you have any, if you thought about expanding this to the wider uh, fields that are supported by NERC instead of just uh, the 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 uh, geomorphology section? Um, so t we have sort of, I mean, I think part of the motivation um, for wanting to keep it within kind of geomorphology broadly defined is that both Dan and I um, develop some fairly popular 
software packages that are used by our communities. And one of the things that would be really useful for us personally would be gathering more of an evidence base about people using our software as well as other things. So from a kind of selfish point of view, um, that's our, our predominant focus at present. But it could be that it could be something that could then be expanded out if we come up with a kind of fairly um, generic workflow for doing this. We could then look at expanding it more broadly to, to fit the whole NERC remit. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I should have, I should have done the virtual uh, round of applause for Derek before. So this is for Derek, round of applause. And then now for Stuart. I'm so bad at that. I wonder if I'll ever learn. Um, thank you both so far um, for, for giving those updates and um, feel free to, to add any notes um, to the collaborative document. Um, ben, are you good to unmute and share anything? Yeah, can you hear me and, and see my slides okay? Yes, and I'm going to okay, use great. the cuckoo timer as well. Uh, let me just get my... Bear with me, sorry. Can you see all this? Okay, yeah, good. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, that was a good waste of time. Um, so, I'm going to be uh, telling you about the Remote Green project that I've been working on and then several events that we've been involved with as a result of this. Um, I'm a, a postdoc at the University of Bristol. I actually work on two particle physics experiments, both of which are searching for dark matter. Uh, and I'm a fellow from the 2019 uh, intake. Um, so I think at the 2019 inaugural meeting, I showed this slide, um, that was in May. That's a lot of text that I'm not going to go through, but I just want to pull out two of the key points here, which is that travel is obviously a major contributor to climate change and that we have pretty good video conferencing because right now we're all joining this meeting remotely. And so this idea kicked off this project known as Remotely Green that we started in October last year. The vision of this is to build a better connected, greener world where remote collaboration is the obvious choice so we don't necessarily travel to join all these events. The way that we are doing working in this project, so we have three steps, three goals. One is to build open core technologies and support their development. Secondly is to research the impact of moving online and how we can make these events more effective. And then thirdly is to really drive this culture change by connecting the key actors that, that are involved in this issue. Um, depending on how you count us, we have between 10 and 20 people and possibly more with a very, very broad set of backgrounds, some mainly from research, but quite a few from the humanitarian sector and also one or two from the private sector. Um, and then to structure this project, we are using a hybrid model. So we have a nonprofit arm called the Remote Green Association, uh, which is in the process of registering now. This is mainly targeting academia and civil society, but it's got a slightly broader scope as well, includes the sort of research aspect. And then we also have a for-profit arm um, uh, known as a company. Uh, this is more targeting business because we realized that on there's actually a much larger fraction of work-related travel if you look at the emissions breakdown. Um, and this is actually where we've been driving a lot of the software development so far. Um, very briefly, a quick overview of that timeline. So we started this in October. It was great to see Derek and your talk that you were at the port because I've, I've been helping organize that. And uh, in 2019, last year, we kicked off this project. We then moved to the Climathon that uh, happened in Geneva in November. And these two hackathons gave us this broad base with all these different people involved, with all the different variety of backgrounds. In January, the for-profit was accepted into the Swiss Circular Economy Incubator, which supports social projects that reduce waste and emissions within the Swiss economy. And then in May, someone at CERN nominated me for a Shuttleworth Foundation flash grant, and I was awarded this in June to support both the association and the, the company itself. Uh, I have too many slides and not enough time, so here are two snippets of research that we've done. Uh, we did a case study that showed that 96% uh, less CO2 will be produced if you bring your event online and we're turning this into a calculator that you can find on an online web page in the near future. And then actually um, with some help of people from the SSI we pushed out a survey that got to about 333 people in about three days and one of the biggest responses piece, uh, pieces was that clearly going online it makes it gets harder to know it's harder to get to know people and so the platform the software we've been developing tackles this specifically so we have uh, basically something that's like zoom breakout rooms but done automatically and slightly on, on steroids so you can match with different people at your events you can make requests in principle to join to talk to people we're building an AI machine learning into the background of this so that we can do this more intelligently um, and on the next slide I have a link that I will not go to but it's a, a link to a YouTube video that just highlights what the platform does it's 30 seconds long but I, I don't have time to go through it because I want to spend the last 
minute and a half whizzing through a few events that we've actually been running online. The first was the, the Versus Virus Hackathon that took place in Switzerland. It's a massive hackathon. We had 4,500 participants join, um, forming 600 teams. They worked for 48 hours um, on a broad set of topics related to the coronavirus. It was one of the largest hackathons in the world. Um, and we, Remote Agreement was involved helping um, put some of these this together. There were lots of partners, 120 partners on this. That was the first one. We, I was much more involved in the second one because I was very busy in the first. Um, and this was obviously a much, we, we scaled it down a bit. We wanted to do it a bit more intimately, but also we focused the scope and it coincided with lockdown ending. Um, but it, built, it built a lot of the ideas that we started in the first round uh, into more of a yeah, complete version to run this online hackathon. The next event was then we took a lot of the ideas that we developed to run the Versus Virus Hackathon and developed the CERN Webfest Hackathon. So this happens every year towards the end of the summer. It's mainly for the CERN summer students, but it had to move online this year because it was fully cancelled. Uh, the theme this year was working together apart, accelerating collaboration. And we drew in 230 participants from 75 countries around the world. Uh, there were 27 projects, some really interesting ideas, some that I think would be fantastic within the SSI as well. So, I mean, I only highlighted three there, but the full list is on that link. We had a really great jury. We had people from the UN, we had a member of the Internet Hall of Fame, uh, we had someone from the Innovation uh, and Hackathon, or the lead Innovation and Hackathon World Economic Forum, and we also had our very own Rachel uh, helping out to judge. So it was very well received. So the CERN team were super happy with this. I think there's a good chance something like this one's again next year. And I've overrun, but I wanted to show you very briefly the product, what I was doing last week, which was PyTech 2020. I helped run 2019. Uh, the 2019 version of my SSI funds, and then we moved it online. We had a thousand participants registered. This was a hard limit because of Zoom. Uh, the early feedback is that 82% wouldn't have come to the original in-person event. So this for me is why another reason why going online is so good. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Sarah. Uh, yeah, we, we hammered a binder hard. Um, we used a lot of interesting tech, and I think it's really, it worked very well. Uh, particularly Slido was great for questions, and um, Jupyter and Binder to give talks and materials. And we also structured the timing uh, we had two slots, one, in, one for Pacific time, one for Atlantic time, so people all around the world could join. And one thing which I think SSI would be great for here is helping how we can improve the gender balance because we have a very skew. Anyway, that is it. I'll take a breath. I'm sorry it was so much and I overrun. But if you want to be involved remotely green, here are some links, here are some ways you can get them stuck. And I put in a, a discussion breakout thing because I want to talk about open sourcing, what we're developing. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, you're fine. I, I, I'm running late. This is my fault. Um, I will be in touch about your help with the CW21 hack day. In case we didn't make that obvious yet, we will be doing CW21 online. Um, any questions for Ben? If you do have any questions, he, um, he has taken over one of the breakout room discussion topics. Uh, so if you want to talk more about Remotely Green, um, that will be happening in breakout room four. So now we're going to move on to that sec. Actually, before we do anything, before we do anything, round of applause. <laughs> right, okay. So next we will be um, moving on to the second half of our call um, with the discussion. So we'll hear from, um, we'll hear from the communications team in a second and then we'll go into breakout rooms. Uh, so start thinking about which breakout room you want to go into. And Selena, would you like to share your screen um, or yeah. Jacqueline? Yeah, just a sec. Oh. Hang on. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, oops. Okay, so hello. Uh, my name is Selena Aragon. I think I, I've, I've met some of you on and off um, over the years. Um, and I'm the communications lead and in this presentation Jacqueline Laird, the communications officer, is also going to be talking. Um, so, here we go. Uh, what does the communication team do at the Institute? Um, well, oops, um, we make sure that we work closely with all the other um, teams at the Institute. Um, including the community team. Um, and this is to uh, communicate our activities and achievements um, to all of our different audiences. So we make sure that our messages are um, being tailored to um, each specific audience and that we're reaching all of them. We're not leaving any, anyone out. 
Um, our main channels for this are the our main online channels anyway are the website and um, and Twitter or social media. Uh, for the website, we're in charge of all the aesthetic content and at least overseeing the aesthetic content content and um, of the SSI blogs and news items. Um, just as a as a point of interest, uh, the blog currently gets about twenty key uh, unique visits per month so we do get a lot of a lot of traffic through there um, and all of you will have written articles for for us probably over the years as well um, so we also have a lot of external contributors which makes um, the blog a, quite a quite an interesting um, outlet and uh, because of that we we've um, put together in the last year um, some brand guidelines to do with um, how to use uh, the SSI logo, uh, what we expect from people um, writing for us, what we expect from people writing for us. And uh, that's why we've also collected um, a few guides for content contributors. So it might be worth having a look at those. And uh, obviously, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with um, either me or Jacqueline. Um, our social media uh, currently consists of Twitter, but we do have other channels. We have YouTube and we're starting to think about uh, pushing forward LinkedIn. Um, our Twitter currently has as over 7.5k followers. So again, if there's something you want to uh, promote or that you want to reach more people than your current followers, then it might be worth getting in touch with us uh, to discuss the possibility of, of uh, posting something online. Um, we also look after the support and providing advice uh, for publicity of events at the Institute. Um, and we are in charge of um, stocking promotional materials like stickers, flyers, t-shirts, hoodies. So again, like if you if you found that you needed more stickers for a specific event or flyers or um, you were thinking of perhaps giving away t-shirts if um, it's, it's something that we could discuss with you if you get in touch with us. And um, lastly, you may all know about the newsletter, the Institute newsletter, um, but if you haven't signed up yet, it's a good place to get um, a digest, a weekly digest of our news items and our blog posts. And now I'll hand over to Jacqueline. Yeah. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jacqueline Laird. I started at the Institute about two months ago Still haven't met anyone in person, but um, that's okay. Lockdown life. Um, so I am involved in putting content onto the website. So the blog posts, news items, um, as part of your fellowships, I know that you need to submit a blog post. Um, so what we're looking for is around 500 words. That is quite flexible. So it can be more or less, um, but that's a good figure to aim for. And at least an image to go with it. Um, if you can provide the credit information, whether it's an image you've taken yourself or it's one that is open source that you've taken from Unsplash or Pixabay or a similar site and let me know the, how to credit it when I put it online, that'd be really helpful. Uh, a general pointer, I, I find when people are submitting their blog posts, they quite often send just a big block of text. So if you could add some subheadings and just a title you think is relevant to break it into sections. That's really helpful for me because I don't have a software background at all. So it's helping me to edit it as well. Um, and also not crucial, but again, helpful, some suggested tags. So when a blog post goes on the website, you can add tags to it. So you can search by similar topics for other relevant blog posts. So if you think, okay, this is relevant to open data, just give me in, in your draft some suggested tags and then I can find an, if there's an existing tag that I can attribute to it. In terms of promoting your events that you're running, um, as well as writing blog posts, you can also um, provide content for a news item if it's a more uh, time sensitive issue. Similar process, just send through some text. Uh, it can be a lot shorter than a blog post with an, uh, an image ideally. And um, we can also put some tweets out to promote your events. So yeah, just let me know if you've got anything that needs promoting.
Oh, you're on mute, Sylvia. I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Forgot to unmute myself. Um, so, yeah, um, we are um, running two discussion sessions. One is to do with the Fellows Monthly Newsletter. Um, this is just to discuss whether this would be useful to you um, to receive a monthly newsletter about various topics. We can talk about that in the discussion session. And Jacqueline is running a blog post content session, which is mainly to figure out how we can support you better in terms of the blog posts that you write as part of your, um, as part of claiming expenses uh, for the activities that you're running. Um, so if you're interested in either of those, join us. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, does anybody have any questions for Selena or Jacqueline before we go into the discussion rooms to talk more about these topics? Everybody okay? Well, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the notes document. Otherwise, feel free to ask them in your um, group discussions. I'm just going to share my screen, which has the instructions for the breakout rooms. So if you look in the, in the notes document about the numbers associated with each of the topics, um, and if you add uh, those numbers to your uh, Zoom display name, I can then push you into the appropriate breakout room. And it's very much appreciated if folks can also join uh, the, yeah, the, the communications ones as well so that we can get your feedback. So let's see, I'm going to probably open them up and then manually push the rest of the people in. Okay, I'm going to open the rooms now and then the remaining people I will. Hello. <laughs> Is that everybody back then? Um, yeah, so sorry if that felt rushed again. I think maybe going forward, what we'll do is we'll do maybe two fellows updates and then spend a little bit longer so that you guys have more time in, in breakout rooms. Um, does anybody want to unmute and share out anything they've discussed in their breakout room? I just wanted to say that um, if the breakout rooms, it, sometimes it's not enough to discuss a particular topic, maybe you want to take the topic further. And, um, you know, if people do, then maybe they should, they should put it that we're happy to discuss this further and select a group of people and maybe just have an hour Zoom call with people to, to help flesh things out because there's a lot of cool stuff that's been discussed and sometimes it's not that much time, but sometimes that's the only time you want to actually give, which is fair enough. But if you want to give more and can give more, fair enough as well. Thanks, Shreve. Anybody else want to share anything? Uh, just from my little chat about uh, the blog content. So I think I will put together some guidance, which I'll stick on the website and I'll, I'll let everyone know when it's together and um, just about generally writing blog posts, what sort of how to write for the web and um, maybe just a little summary of what we're looking for in terms of, yeah, the structure and things like that. Awesome. Thanks, Jacqueline. In that case, I'll also just mention in Selena's breakout room, we talked about a monthly fellows newsletter. So if you do have a moment, if you want to read those notes and if, if a monthly newsletter is sort of following these calls, um, kind of reminding you of any links or events going on, especially fellows events that maybe you want to get involved with, or if you have any calls for collaboration, we can package this up and send it to the all fellows mailing list. Um, as kind of a monthly thing. So if that's something you'd be interested in, if you want to just add a plus one or something anywhere to the to the breakout room one um, section of the notes. But otherwise, um, I guess we'll wrap up. Um, let me share the screen. So if you do have any feedback from this call, there's space at the very bottom of the notes document um, so that we can improve your future calls. Uh, we will be skipping a community call in August uh, just due to many people being on holiday. So our next call will be in September and I'll be in touch with the doodle poll to find out what time and date um, suit folks best. Um, but there's a link to sign up or register your interest if you want to get a fellows update on a future call. 
Um, there's also space if you want to share any upcoming events or calls, um, promote anything or add any requests for peer assists, or if you want to shout out anybody, um, feel free to do that or if anybody wants to unmute and do that. Um, I did add some links to CarpentryCon at home sessions that are being run by fellows um, in case that's of interest to anybody. But otherwise, um, if anybody wants to unmute and share anything, promote anything. No? Awesome. I um, guess we'll fin. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it's slightly too late. Uh, I have a habit of doing that. Um, yeah, if anybody's interested in uncertainty quantification or verification and validation, we released the toolkit a few weeks ago. Uh, get in touch. It's all open source and open development, so all the dirt is on the street. <laughs> Awesome, that sounds great. Um, if you want to add uh, a link or any contact information for that in the notes, that would be very helpful as well. And we can follow okay. up on that. Um, awesome. Well, in that case, it was really great to see you all. Have a, I hope you take some time for holiday and relax and take care of yourselves and get in touch if you need anything. But have a great afternoon. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rachel. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>